Imagine going to sleep tonight after this TED talk and waking up to a whole different reality where you are operating your very own spaceship at Bill, dressed up in whatever you want to be. That reality is in fact not too far away from where we are today. If you have been on the internet for the past few months, you would be familiar with this new universe called the Metaverse, which was also one of the buzzwords for 2021. The word Metaverse can be traced back to its first appearance in a science fiction novel from 1992 named Snow Crash as a combination of the two words Meta and Universe. The word Meta comes from the Greek word, meaning beyond or transcending. In very simple terms, the Metaverse transcends our physical universe and exists as a digital universe on the, on the internet you can assess through your virtual or mixed reality headset. I grew up playing web browser games on a dark connection because, you know, I'm an IT kid. And I have admittedly spent more time playing than I studied for school. <laughs> In 2001, when I was five years old, I recall playing RuneScape, a fantasy game in a medieval setting. At a young age of five, I learned how to identify the differences between an oak tree and a willow tree and a trout versus a cod. Just because activities like wood cutting and fishing were part of that game. You have to know that this is a very big thing in a concrete jungle like Singapore because we don't see any of those things here on a daily basis. Not only was I learning things beyond my level, but I was also a very happy child as I get to shake away the stress of having to study by playing video games, which did a lot of good for my mental health contrary to popular belief. Teachers were curious if my parents signed me out for enrichment classes because how would a child otherwise know so much, right? That was when I realized my learning experience in childhood was significantly so much better than all of my fellow schoolmates who were forced to memorize encyclopedias or go for enrichment classes. Not because I was a gifted child, but because of the medium in which educational information was delivered to me. That was the very beginning of my lifelong journey of researching on how non-traditional platforms like video games and virtual reality can make life better for all of us in the field of educational psychology and mental health. Growing up in the digital age, we all have seen how our ways of remote communications have been enhanced by the advancement of technology. We started from texting via messages to writing to each other on Facebook, Friendster, and Twitter. When our smartphones have the capability to support the sending of pictures online, we shared our experiences through photos on Instagram and videos on platforms like Vine, Snapchat, YouTube, and TikTok. We have progressed from text to images and from images to videos, and it gets more immersive every time we progress from one face to another. What comes next? Just last year in April, Microsoft unveiled a new product that can assess Microsoft Teams from the mixed reality glasses, HoloLens. Later in the same year, during a virtual Facebook Connect event in October, its CEO announced that Facebook is changing its name to Meta to align with the new vision that the company is working towards, to develop a virtual world where people will live, work, play in, also known as the Metaverse. As someone who has been actively researching, how the movement towards virtualization can benefit the field of psychology even during pre-COVID-19 times and the potential pitfalls we should keep a, look, keep a look out for, I am also particularly focused on how Metaverse can revolutionize mental health services for all of us. It is a known fact that there has been a widespread decline in mental health globally during the pandemic. And we all know it has been especially challenging for people to get the help they need due to enforcement of stay home and safe distancing protocols. In the context of Singapore in 2020, therapy and psychological treatments were briefly classified as non-essential services. It took a large band of practitioners, including myself, to petition for it to be labeled as essential. Let's imagine sometime in the future, history repeats itself again and touch root, another wave of global pandemic has hit us. But this time, Instead of being denied access to mental health services, we now have therapists and users of mental health services all on the metaverse. How would things be different for us? 
even during before the onset of COVID-19, the idea of integrating virtual reality with mental health services has already offered very effective and unique opportunities for the treatment of mental health conditions. This is evident in studies done even as early as 1995 where a group of researchers made use of VR for graded exposure in treating a student's acrophobia. The subject was a 19-year-old student with a fear of heights, particularly elevators. They found that by gradually increasing the number of stories in the simulated VR environment, the subject has displayed significant improvement with heights in real life, which has made VR a suitable and viable alternative medium for exposure therapy. Aside from the realm of mental health services, about a few years ago, I was also working on an ed tech project that taps on educational psychology. Essentially, this project is a VR public speaking simulation to help students with dyslexia speak more confidently. When I first started working on it, truth be told, I was a little skeptical because how can you improve your public speaking skills by talking to virtual avatars and virtual people, right? I thought, if anything, that's going to make you become a social recluse. To my surprise, there were many success stories, and one story was particularly memorable for me. When we did a simulation with one of the students, there was this one nervous kid who fidgeted the most and wasn't able to make any eye contact with anyone. After getting comfortable in a VR environment, this kid spoke for a good five minutes with perfect pronunciation and used the most natural gestures and even made eye contact with 50 people in a virtual auditorium, something that we have never seen him done before in real life. How amazing is that? We found that the cartoonish characters of VR have helped to increase the confidence of a student speaking, especially if they have a fear of speaking to a real person, as they often may find direct eye contact very daunting. In a way, this is also the first step in exposure therapy. If you cannot make eye contact with the person in real life, like your teachers and therapists, you can start speaking to a virtual character or an avatar. The difference between such studies and what we are interested in right now is the new element of interconnectivity, which is one of the key characteristics of metaverse. By interconnectivity, it means that instead of us interacting in the virtual environment as an individual, in a small enclosed virtual space, we can now interact with everyone else in the world, including our therapists with our virtual reality or virtual reality headsets. As a counselor, like most of my fellow practitioners, I always had reservations about remote counseling, be it through online video counseling platforms like Zoom or through the metaverse. During the onset of COVID-19, when all practitioners have no choice but to conduct remote counseling, we all have multiple concerns about the digital environment, such as the loss of human touch and the sense of, sense of connectedness with the other party. As we all know, the objective and the main job of all counsellors is to be there to support your client. To put it simply, we have one job, be there and support your client. But how can you be there to support your client when you're not even there? Driven by the curiosity to answer that question, my research group decided to do a study with counselors in training to see if remote counseling is indeed effective in comparison to in-person. Over a course of approximately one year, we saw how appointments of online video counseling with these counselors were more highly attended than sessions in person. What does that mean? It means that if all one has to do is switch on their computer or put on their headset at home, they might be more likely to turn up for counseling because it's convenient. For example, if users have social anxiety or depression and have difficulty stepping out of their room, their in-person counselors will experience higher cancellation rates in comparison to those who offer alternative remote options such as video counseling. This can also be applied to delivering mental health services in the metaverse where we ensure clients with such needs still get the help they require. The ultimate goal is not to eradicate in-person sessions altogether, but to offer an alternative option that caters to such needs. Now that we have talked about how great the potential of the metaverse is for the field of psychology, you may have a question. Don't you think metaverse might cause some issues 
like addiction or you know safety and data privacy. As we speak about speak about this, I believe some of you already may have jumped ahead and started visualizing this dystopian society where all of us are hooked to our VR headsets and happily letting giant corporations exploit our data. Okay, now let's put that thought on hold and imagine that we have time traveled back to the year 2001. We survived the Y2K millennium bug last year and all of you are now five-year-old Stellas. It's a Friday afternoon and you are sitting in your dad's office chair looking up at a very thick IBM monitor. Both of your tiny feet are resting on your most beloved CPU case because your legs are too short to reach the floor. You push the on button with the tip of your toe and you hear the nostalgic, glorious, soothing melody of Windows Me starting up. The game RuneScape was just released and you are over the moon to chop down some virtual trees and fish for some virtual fishes an experience that you can never get firsthand as a five-year-old living in Singapore. Suddenly, your parents walked in on you, and instead of letting you go about your day as usual, you hear them say, don't you think being on a computer might cause some issues like addiction or, you know, safety and data privacy? Let's cut off the internet and sell the computer for Stella's sake. She needs to only read encyclopedias and go for enrichment classes just like everyone else in her school. How would things be different for us today if that were to happen? We can't say for sure how different my life would turn out to be 20, 20 years down the road. But what I know for sure is that if that had happened, I wouldn't even be sitting here sharing with you about my amazing childhood education journey of learning non-traditionally. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that those concerns um, these people raise about the internet or the metaverse are invalid. What I'm saying is, by now, you would have already realized that choosing to turn away from the technological innovations is definitely not how we can solve problems arising from them. It is not about whether my RuneScape running on my Internet Explorer can do us good or bad. It is about whether we can use it to do good or do bad. As future inhabitants of the metaverse, just like how we were all inevitably once part of the Industry 4.0 revolution, where we all ended up having the internet and social media in our pockets, we all have a role to play in addressing these concerns. What do I mean by that? Similar to the universe that we are living in right now, we hold organizations serving as custodians of our personal information and services we are using accountable. Likewise, we should continue to use our voices and demand accountability as we always have. For example, if you have doubts about how safe and how private the platform is, the question you should be asking organizations behind the push for metaverse is, how do they demonstrate that they are ensuring safe and responsible development? For people like myself, and probably some of you in the audience here, who are in the field of psychology and mental health, our role is to ensure that the users physical and psychological safety are met before any remote sessions can even take place, be it online video calls or in the metaverse. For example, have you thought about what will happen if your abusive spouse is eavesdropping right outside your physical door while you are in this metaverse complaining to your therapist about them? As a professional, you can use an assessment checklist detailing what requirements users of the metaverse need to meet. This can help us objectively assess if therapy in the metaverse is appropriate for our clients and take steps to recommend face-to-face -face therapy as an alternative, if necessary. This is also what you might ought to know as a potential user of the services on metaverse. You have to be mindful of your physical surroundings and take precautions of your personal safety prior to logging on. Also, who's to say what kind of regulations, enhancements, and guidelines our regulatory bodies will implement to make it safe for all of us? The point is, there are definitely solutions to these concerns we have about the metaverse. We can have our reservations and doubts about its potential, just like I did when I had no choice but to bring my therapy session from in-person to online. But choosing stagnation over progress, just because 
we can't be bothered to think about new solutions to new problems brought about by technological advancements is clearly not the way to go. Our current universe will not be what it is today if not for all the things we have done as human beings collectively, be it good or bad. Do you think that the current universe we inhabit in has been serving us well? If your answer is yes, that's great. What did we do to ensure that it has been serving us well? Can we also apply that to the metaverse? If your answer is no, what actions should we be taking to make it better? Similarly, the emergence of the metaverse itself does not carry any meaning on its own. It is all about what meaning we give to it as unique individuals. It is never about whether technology saves or destroys humanity. It is about whether we are using it to save or destroy humanity. Thank you.